Okay, let's say we've just cut down our forest and replanted it all with saplings. So all the trees are going to be the same age as they grow up. At some point, we're going to clear cut the forests, just cut all the trees, then replant it. The situation could be better with selective cutting, only cutting some of the trees, keeping the forest intact. But we're just going to look at clear cutting for now because it's easier to visualize what we're talking about. One of the most important decisions in forestry economics is when to harvest a given stand of trees. What should the crop rotation period be? In this video, we're going to look at a few factors that go into that decision. Let's look at how the amount of wood of a tree grows over time. During the early years of its growth, it grows slow. There's not a lot of roots or leaves, so the plant just can't get nutrients fast enough to grow quickly. Once it does get bigger, the growth rate increases. It grows faster and faster until at some point its roots and leaves are competing with other trees. Or maybe it's just getting to the maximum size it can get, so the growth rate eventually slows down or stops. Later, the tree is probably going to get so old that it's basically dying of old age. They become more susceptible to disease, insects, beavers. It depends on the tree. Some trees like peach trees will be outlived by a teenager. Other trees like the bristlecone pine can outlive many human civilizations. But for our purposes, let's just assume the growth pattern for a forest we are interested in using for the production of wood looks like this. Like an individual tree, the forest as a whole grows slow in the beginning, starts to grow faster, then levels off. Here it's sometimes seen that an even-aged forest will actually decline in wood volume. It's similar to the growth pattern you might see with bacteria in the lab as they use up their medium or they get a buildup of waste products, they die off. Presumably with a forest, as old trees rot and new trees take their place, the total volume of wood will reach an equilibrium. And I think it's getting into the realm of what you might call an old growth forest. Depends what the forest looks like. Either way, past this point, the forest isn't really growing in value. And this is why foresters will dislike old growth forests from a money-making point of view at least. The forest isn't really increasing in value, they want to cut it so it can be regrown. So assuming we're going to use it for forestry again after we harvest, what is the optimal harvest age? How long should we let the forest stand before each time we cut it? It depends what you're aiming for. Looking at this, to maximize the amount of wood we're getting, we would harvest here. We wouldn't be getting the maximum amount of wood this particular stand of trees can give. If we wanted that, we would just wait till it's the highest volume over here. But we don't care about when the forest has the most wood it can have. We care about how much wood we're getting. The whole point is, where can we harvest that maximizes our yearly growth? So to calculate that, it would just be total volume of wood divided by the number of years at that point. Okay, it's just the slope of this line. Let's add a little thing here, just so we can visualize the slope of the line, the average growth rate. As we trace along the line, looking at the average slopes, we can see that our yearly wood production increases as we wait. That kind of slows until here, where it is maximized. Then as we go on, the total amount of wood increases, but our average wood production is decreasing. We would have been better off chopping the forest down back there and then replanting it to take advantage of the way this forest grows. We'll call this the maximum sustainable yield. But this is just based on what they call the biological characteristics of the forest, without factoring in the economic side. But for better or for worse, people will treat this forest in terms of how much benefit it can provide. Probably most importantly, how much money it makes. You know, is it a source or a sink for money? Unless if the owners don't care about money, this is probably what will drive the decisions. Keeping it very very simple we're just going to look at the forest in terms of the wood production for now basically looking at the forest from the perspective of a single firm let's first look at how revenue is generated from the forest let's say we own the land and the trees and we're trying to find out when is a good time to sell the right to chop down and take the trees we're not going to chop it ourselves but just sell that right the price that buyers will pay us to chop down the trees, basically the value of the tree, is called the stumpage value. The revenue per volume of wood won't be a simple one-to-one -one relationship, even if we assume the price of wood doesn't change. Because in the beginning, when the tree is small, you can't really use it for anything. Maybe just for pulp and paper for a small tree. So it doesn't have a lot of value. As it gets wider and wider, you can get bigger and bigger cuts with clear grain that can make more valuable products. So the price per volume of wood increases as the diameter of the tree increases. It's not only increasing in value because the volume is increasing, but the wood itself is becoming more valuable. Graphically, the stumpage value of the forest over the years looks like this. The average growth rate of the value of the forest to any particular age is just taken as the total stumpage value divided by the year. So again, finding the spot where we are maximizing our yearly growth, what we'll call our maximum sustainable revenue in this case, is pretty easy to do qualitatively. It's just where this slope is highest. 
So here. In terms of maximizing revenue, this is the optimal rotation age. After we cut, assuming the forest will grow back in an identical fashion, we will be getting the most money we can get from this parcel of land from forestry. If we repeat the forestry rotation, we will be maximizing our revenue. That's why we call it the maximum sustainable revenue. Okay, let's look at the same relationship, but let's look at it from the perspective of the yearly and average growth of the value of the trees. Let's say this square represents the stumpage value of the forest right now. And this is the growth that will happen this year. This is the incremental growth. It's a measure of the rate at which the forest is growing. That is to say, the rate at which the stumpage value is growing. The average growth, or mean annual increment, is you take the total growth and divide it by the number of years. So if we were in year 5, divide it by 5, this section here would represent the average growth. The incremental growth is a measure of how fast the forest is growing. The average growth is kind of a measure of how efficiently the forest has grown. If we're concentrated on how much stumpage value we're getting for each year, we want to maximize the average growth like we did before. Let's look at the average and incremental growth at different stages of the stumpage value graph. Let's just pretend this forest will become mature in seven years. It just makes the math easier to visualize. In year zero here, the stumpage value isn't increasing and there is no stumpage value, so the incremental growth is zero and the average growth is zero. In year one, the stumpage value is still zero, so the average growth is zero, but we have some incremental growth. In year two, we have some growth, so the total growth divided by two gives us the average growth. It's kind of small. The incremental growth is getting bigger as the forest grows faster. Year three, average growth is larger as the forest gets larger, but it's still a little bit low because of those first few years where the stumpage didn't increase. The incremental growth is even higher. This is where the growth is fastest. Year four, average growth increasing again, but incremental growth is starting to decrease as the trees start to get in each other's way. Year five, the average growth is getting to about as high as it can be. This spot is very close to the maximum sustainable revenue, and the incremental growth is slowing even more. Year six, the incremental growth is done. The forest stumpage value isn't increasing anymore. The average growth has decreased and will continue to decrease from here on out. Let's put average and incremental growth on their own graph. We only used seven years on the other graph, so it's going to look a little bit different because we have so much more resolution. So it looks like this. Okay, so if we want to find the optimal rotation age, it's the same thing. We're trying to find the spot where the average growth is maximized. So on this graph, it's here. And the incremental growth line will cross the average growth line at this maximum. Okay. That's fine, but we can't make a decision based just on revenue. We have to include some costs in here too. Let's just include one for now, the opportunity cost on the capital, the capital being our trees. In any given year, we can sell the trees, get the stumpage value, then we could put that money in a bank and it would earn interest. So that interest rate is basically our opportunity cost for not chopping down the trees in a given year. The decision to sell the stumpage rights for a buyer to come cut our trees comes when the value of the trees is no longer growing faster than the interest rate. We're not going to keep growing the trees if we can just sell those trees and then put that money in a bank and earn more money that way. While the growth of the trees and the value of the trees is going to slow down and stop, the interest rate stays constant. So the decision is going to be based on two things, the interest rate and how fast the value of the forest is increasing. First, we want to find the rate the value the forest is growing at so we can compare it to the interest rate. If this is the total value of the forest right now, and this is how much the forest is expected to grow by the end of the year, dividing the new growth by the value of the forest right now gives us by what percent the value of the forest will grow by next year. It's very much like an interest rate. So we can use this to compare against an interest rate to see when the optimal rotation age should be. In the beginning, by what percent are the trees growing by? it would be high, more than 100% for the first year. There was no stumpage value before, so the new stumpage value, the incremental growth, it makes up more than 100% of the growth. Even though the growth is slow here, the percent change in value is high because the new growth makes up such a large percent of the total growth. As you get more and more, even though the growth rate is increasing, the percent that is new growth is constantly decreasing over time. And then eventually the incremental growth becomes zero, so the percent growth in stumpage value becomes zero. Graphically, what we've done is divide the incremental growth, this line, by the total growth, this line up here. Although I guess that doesn't really help you visualize the relationship. Just letting you know what's going on. 
So if this is the interest rate and we were in this year, what should we do? The value of the forest will only grow by this percentage, but if we had sold the stumpage rights and put that money in a bank, it could have grown by this percentage. If we were back here, the value of our forest is growing by this percent, but if we sold the stumpage rights and then put our money in a bank, we would only gain this much from interest. So we should probably just let our forest grow. It's this year here that will be the year that we set our rotation cycle to, to maximize economic rent. By letting the forest grow, our money isn't growing by as much as it could if we had sold the stumpage rights and just put that money in a bank. Note, now that we're considering the opportunity cost on stumpage value, we're harvesting sooner. We'll look more at that later. There are much more realistic models for deciding the rotation age, you know, models that look at more than one or two factors, but we're going to use this one just as a broad visualization. This was a lot to take in. If you don't understand it, don't worry. In the next video, we're going to look at these exact same relationships in a slightly different way. And we'll add a few things too.